In the United States, one in five prison and jail beds are occupied by someone suffering from mental illness, making America's prisons the new mental institution. Hi, I'm Megan, one of the founders here at Don't Incarcerate, Alleviate, or DIA for short. We are an advocacy group that has dedicated time to preserving the interests of incarcerated individuals coping with mental illness. We are committed to the protection of mentally ill individuals against the abuse and negligence seen in the Department of Corrections mental health system. We consider our nation's use of jails and prisons as holding and treatment centers to be the incorrect course of action. There is a certain care to be paid to the mentally ill, which cannot be provided in unaccredited jails and prisons. These individuals should be treated in a dedicated mental health facility. Did you know the three largest psychiatric facilities are jails located in New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago? But how? Mental health, mental health holds, unavailability of psychiatric beds, and outdated laws making law enforcement the first line in mental health interference all contribute to the growing concerns surrounding housing mental health patients within the Department of Corrections. Those suffering from hallucinations and those at risk for suicide are often housed with offenders after police are called to intervene, creating the illusion of safety to the world. But would you want your loved one who is suffering with mental illness sharing a cell with a real offender? Would you want your loved one kept in a cell for being sick and not for committing a crime? Prison should not be the new mental institution. While incarceration may differ for someone suffering a psychotic break, prisons and jails should not be used to treat the mentally ill because of the rampant abuse and negligence that can occur. It is a civil rights violation and it criminalizes and demonizes the mentally ill. You can't prepare for a brighter future without first understanding the past. It appears the United States is currently in a dangerous cycle. Before the 1700s, the mentally ill were housed in prisons. However, during this time period, we began to hear voices of protest in the colonies, claiming that confining mentally ill persons to prisons and jails was inhumane. Still, it wasn't, it wasn't until 1752 that the first state psychiatric hospital wing was dedicated to the treatment of the mentally ill at the Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia. 21 years later, the nation got its first dedicated psychiatric hospital in Williamsburg, Virginia in 1773. In the 1800s, Morphus is a notable advocate during this time. In 1848, she pioneered New Jersey's first mental institution and pleaded with Congress to pass the 12,225,000 acre act, which would dedicate land to the building of more facilities. While her bill passed Congress, President Franklin Pierce vetoed the bill on the grounds that it would be President Franklin Pierce vetoed the bill on the grounds that it would be prejudicial rather than beneficial. By 1880, 75 public psychiatric hospitals existed in our young nation. The 1940s and 50s drove new discovery in the field. World War II's end brought both victory and turmoil to the United States as decorated soldiers arrived home traumatized and in need of short-term treatment options as opposed, to the, as opposed to the previous asylum isolation techniques. In 1955, the largest number of psychiatric beds were available at 559,000. In 1963, President John Retardation, which translated into legislature that, si that was signed into law by Lyndon B. Johnson, marking the start of the Community Mental Health Center movement or the start of deinstitutionalization. Joseph Bloom, a, a psychiatrist beginning his residency during this time, said, Unfortunately, in retrospect, and for, a, and for a variety of reasons, the Community Mental Health Center movement was a conceptual success but an actual failure. These reasons would come to light when President Jimmy Carter gave his 1979 address in which he noted that 700 community health centers had been built that served some 3 million patients. However, the majority of the population 3 million patients. However, the majority of the population was not being served. This means that individuals previously institutionalized were being rapidly released into the community without the proper rehabilitation or treatment options. Real federal involvement ceased with the election of Ronald Reagan in the 19th policy with support for individual financial aid. During this time, the mentally ill's presence in jails and prisons continued to rise. Today, psychiatric beds are scarce, with only 37,769 being reported in 2016. 
Police have become the first stop for the mentally ill due to laws requiring violence before intervention, effectively criminalizing the mentally ill. A lack of funding has created neglectful treatment tactics if the individual is treated at all. Inconsistent community-based programs have created a vicious cycle between medical facilities and prison facilities. Prisons have become the new housing facilities, with the state of New Hampshire holding severely mentally ill patients within the Department of Corrections. Those at risk for suicide are held in solitary cells, not psychiatric hospitals, with no offer of treatment. Now that we went over a little history, we will discuss the three reasons mentioned earlier. What's the three reasons mentioned earlier? Why the practice of using prisons as mental institutions should stop. The widespread abuse and neglect occurring to the mentally ill in these facilities, the fact that it is a severe violation of civil rights to hold the mentally ill when they have not committed any crime, and the perception it creates of the mentally ill as criminals. Abuse and neglect are two very dangerous concerns facing mental health in prisons and jails. The best way to explain what we are seeing is with three examples. I first want to talk about a lawsuit that was brought against Oregon in 2002. The Federal District Court for the District of Oregon decided in favor of the plaintiffs who sought to compel the state of Oregon to provide more expeditious treatment for criminal defendants who had been found incompetent to stand trial and who were languishing in Oregon jails waiting for beds at the Oregon State Hospital. Data was presented that proved seriously mentally ill individuals were being held for abnormally long times under questionable conditions waiting to be evaluated and or placed in treatment beds at the hospital. The average days spent waiting were 32, while some individuals were held for more than 60 days. Another example is that of Jenny Hill. Jenny Hill is a survivor of physical and sexual abuse and was previously diagnosed and sexual abuse and was previously diagnosed with PTSD with dissociation and trauma-induced psychosis. One night in 2010, she suffered a psychotic break brought on by the stress of discussing the financial settlement of her divorce. She remembers hearing voices in her head causing suicidal ideation. Loss of what to do called the police. Jenny was handcuffed, placed in the back of a cruiser, and taken to jail. This only exacerbated her condition, meaning she was unable to focus and communicate with officers effectively. A psychosis-induced altercation led to Jenny sustaining injuries from correctional officers because her brain was telling, was telling her to protect herself from more harm. A crisis intervention officer finally stepped in and was able to calm Jenny down. However, during the entire 36 hours she was held, Hill was never offered any psychiatric treatments and no protection from others in her holding cell. Federal level prisons are not exempt from these types of, lack of funding has created a severe understaffing problem, making it impossible for prisons to implement policies aimed at improving mental health access. John Rudd was an inmate at a federal prison located near Hazleton, West Virginia in 2017. He had been diagnosed in a psychiatric hospital in 1992 and schizophrenia. When the voices in his head got louder and louder, he told staff he wanted to harm himself. After being moved to a suicide watch cell, Rudd tried to break his neck by banging his head repeatedly against the concrete wall. He was then injected with haloperidol, an antipsychotic used to treat his with haloperidol, an antipsychotic used to treat his condition to calm him down. Despite these events, the very next day, a psychologist wrote that he would be moved out of the suicide watch cell and remain on care level 1, a label for those with no significant mental health needs. Rudd's diagnoses were marked as resolved, and he, and he was diagnosed instead with antisocial personality disorder. Staff accused Rudd of faking his symptoms, leaving it up to Rudd and his voices to tell staff if he wanted to hurt himself. Once released, with the help of Tammy Seltzer, director of the D.C. Jail and Prison Advocacy Project, Rudd was able to receive the proper care for his Seltzer's organization was also able to procure an apartment and disability benefits for Rudd, although his prison diagnosis could have potentially disqualified him. This type of treatment continues to happen daily. A severe lack of funding means prison psychologists are doubling as corrections officers, patients are being held with Officers are untrained to handle psychi psychiatric outbursts. These reasons and many more contribute to the abuse and neglect we see in prisons. However, the simplest explanation is that the Department of Corrections has been placed in a position that they should never have been.
It is well known that once in prison, most of your basic freedom once in prison, most of your basic freedoms are taken away. However, how would you feel if your rights were taken away without ever having committed a crime? That is just what happened to Andrew Butler and his father Doug. Andrew Butler was a model student athlete whose schizophrenic symptoms appeared after an adverse reaction to hallucinogenic hallucinogenic mushrooms. When Doug Butler hospitalized his son, Andrew's condition only worsened, leading Andrew to attempt to who hit his father in January of 2018. Since others seen and reported the almost hit, Andrew was transferred out of the New Hampshire hospital and into the New Hampshire SPU. Andrew was issued the same kind of jumpsuit as a convicted criminal, assigned an inmate number and held with pretrial detainees, those not competent to stand trial and those found not guilty by reason of insanity. Doug Butler's guardianship had been taken away and Andrew was now in the hands of the Department of Corrections for an unspecified, unspecified amount of time. Andrew was treated with bipolar di disorder medication for fear his schizophrenic medication would be sold within the prison. It was four months later that Doug Butler learned that his son could be held in this type of solitary confinement for 23 hours a day for the rest of his life. Andrew, Andrew was continuously denied contact visits with his father and attorney. He was tasered by guards, and other than the incorrect medication he was given, Andrew only received one-hour group therapy sessions. The treatment he has received is cruel and unusual punishment without having been convicted of a crime with no pending criminal process. Andrew's case was heard in federal court as neighbors and friends organized a two-mile walk from the prison to the courthouse, pleading for his release. Andrew was not released that day. However, the voices of protest were heard, and Andrew was transferred back to the New Hampshire hospital and released to his father two weeks later. When asked how he feels, Doug Butler, Doug Butler said, Anytime they want to, they could latch on to him and throw him back in prison. They would not have to go to court. He'd be better off and have more rights if he was a criminal. Andrew Butler's story also helps us to understand how the mentally ill are criminalized, as does Jenny Hills. There has always been a well-known yet Jenny Hills. There has always been a well-known yet rarely verbalized stigma against the severely mentally ill. From children on the playground to full-grown adults, no one wants to befriend the mentally ill patient because they are dangerous. People are scared of the seriously mentally ill and allowing them to be held against their will in our nation's prison to this fire. By criminalizing the mentally ill and locking them away from society, we are effectively worsening their symptoms, ignoring substance abuse disorders, allowing abuse, promoting recidivism, promoting suicide, and contributing to jail and prison overcrowding. Criminalizing mental illness worsens the health of hundreds of their recovery by creating additional barriers to housing and employment. Behavioral health treatment programs have been proven effective in reducing recidivism and incarceration. However, we continue to house our mentally ill in jails and prisons like the common criminal. Why do we continue to house those in need with true dangerous criminals? Continue to house those in need with true dangerous criminals and expect the general public to know the difference. So where do we begin to start in our quest for change? I believe we begin with national leadership and policy. First and foremost, there needs to be a national mental health plan, a consensus plan that is actively supported by the federal government. The mentally ill should be in a proper treatment facility, not at the hands of the Department of Corrections. A proper allocation of the funds already available would provide temporary relief until the funds become available for the real change. We need hospitals. We are not calling for the asylums of the past to reappear from existing hospitals and the building up of our existing treatment facilities. Included with the need for a revitalization of inpatient mental health services is the redevelopment of functional civil commitment laws. These laws provided intervention options for the severely mentally ill before law enforcement involvement was necessitated. It is most important to build up community-based treatment centers in order to assure proper treatment can be maintained after inpatient release. The most pressing matter is that protocols and policy need to change. To end on a positive note, Alyssa Roth, a journalist researching the use of prisons as mental, prisons as mental health institutions, stated, One of the heartening things I found in all of this very upsetting reporting is that there is a consensus that what we're doing is wrong. 
Help us to create the change we need to see and advocate against prisons being the new mental institution. Thank you.